I watched the first three episodes of The Rings of Power so you wouldn't have to. And by the way, there will be spoilers. Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Berry. Welcome to the Studio Jake Vidcast, where I talk about all things pop culture. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, ring that little bell so you get notifications when I post a new vidcast, and consider becoming a channel member. During the first season of The Rings of Power, I went through an episode-by-episode episode breakdown and explained the contradictions with the source material, why this particular characterization is bad, and so on. And I will do more of that in this second season. However, because they released three episodes at one time, so discussing the debut episode and the two subsequent ones, I am going to do more of an abridged version of what I did before because these three episodes introduce not one, not two, not three story arcs, but five. That's right. We of the audience are expected to keep up with five different story arcs that barely impact one another, and it does get burdensome just from a viewer standpoint. And let me just tell you, I was hoping that the showrunners would have learned from their mistakes, that they would have taken the criticism that Tolkien fans who have read the books, enjoyed the Peter Jackson films, and even The Hobbit, and even the animated films, to some degree. I know it varies depending on who you talk to, but they didn't. No, they doubled down on their efforts to turn every single male into some sort of beta whipping boy and every single female into a man. <laughs> it was a disaster from the beginning. So I'm going to go into it. And again, I'm going to reiterate my spoiler alert. And I just want to say the debut they gave us the origin for Halibrand. So as you know, Halib Halibrand is actually Sauron in the form of a man. Now in the Cimmerillion, he does take the form of a man, but in a very different context to how it is portrayed in Rings of Power, and more on that later. But basically what happens is Morgoth has been defeated, and so the orcs are not wanting to fight, which is really dumb. The whole point of the orcs is they are a war race. They constantly are in a state of conflict, even among each other. The goblins, the orcs, and the Uruks all hate each other, but they're kind of forced to coexist because they work for the Dark Power. So what happens is the Uruk Adar, he betrays Sauron and stabs him, and a bunch of orcs stab him multiple times. He explodes and turns into venom for some reason. And then you see him eat a rat, a centipede, and finally a person. And that's what turns him into Halibrand. He runs into this group of migrants and that's where he finds the, like the Royal pendant. He goes on a boat with them. The boat sinks. And of course, that's how he meets Galadriel in the first season. And then we go into the main story arc. So basically the main one is Galadriel is convinced that Sauron is still out there, obviously, because she ran into Halibrand in season one's finale. So she refuses to tell anyone this. Elrond's really mad at her. He rides and informs the High King of the situation, which the High King of the Elves, you know, should have been informed about. Gladriel kind of blames Elrond for all this. Elrond manages to escape with the rings, and he brings them to an elf that builds boats, I guess, and he's supposed to be very old and wise. Elrond convinces this guy to destroy the rings, or at least to cast them into the ocean, into this deep chasm. The guy, however, accidentally knocks out a ring, and he betrays Elrond. Elrond's very angry about this, and he kind of goes into like this self-imposed exile. However, because of the information he told the High King, he doesn't really trust Galadriel. And she is given one of the rings, though, because they make it clear the High King does not trust her. But for some reason, he lets her have one of the rings. It just kind of falls on the ground when the boatmaster guy shows back up. He takes one of the rings, gives one to the High King, and then Gladriel just picks one up off the ground. No one says, hey, Gladriel, you're going to have poor butt judgment when it comes to people. Maybe you shouldn't have it. Well, she starts to see visions. She goes to Elrond, a beggar, to come back to the king and convince them to go back into the Northlands, which has now become uh, Mordor. Or excuse me, the Southlands. The Southlands have now become Mordor. 
we go back to what Halibran is up to, and he's basically been captured by Adar, but Adar doesn't seem to recognize him as Sauron. Halibran, after being tortured a little bit, convinces Adar to let the people of the South go, but still pretending to be their king, and that he can bring him Sauron. Of course, Halibran is Sauron. He then goes to Celebrimbor, who is, of course, the jeweler, the jeweler who made the rings, and turns into like this angelic elf and convinces him that he is an elf forger, that he was just pretending to be the king of the Southlands. And he even says, Gladriel found out who I really was and cast me out. So you got that little half lie. What ends up happening is the Celebrimbor contacts the dwarves because what was happening with the elves when they forged the rings were their mystical tree, which, by the way, in the books, the mystical tree has nothing to do with the elves' immortality or their existence on Middle Earth. So I don't know why that was a thing. But whatever's happening to them is also happening to the dwarves. So Celebrimbor reaches out to Durin the Fourth, who is still in a fight with his dad. One of the things that really angered me about this is Disa, who is supposed to be Durin the Fourth's wife. She plays both sides. So first, she's called before the king because she's a kind of a magical singer. And which, to the actress's credit, she is a very good singer. She does a good job, unless it's some sort of auto-tune, I don't know. But giving her the benefit of the doubt, she sings sort of a magical dwarven song, but it does nothing. But then she sort of woman explains to the king that he was in the wrong and she, he needs to make up with his son. She then goes to Durin and does the exact opposite. She says, the king was right and you should go. You should swallow your pride in a pub. Which is it, Disa? <laughs> they were trying to make her like this all wise, I'm going to tell the men what's up. And then she contradicts herself. When Durin reaches out to Celebrimbor, Durin is a little suspicious, but brings the information to his father and uses that as a, as a way to kind of bridge the gap. And then the last scene with them is Durin the third, the king of the dwarves, or at least the dwarves in this particular mountain in, in uh, Khazad-dun. He goes to Celebrimbor and Halibrand's new form, and he has a new name that means the giver of gifts or whatever. Those storylines are going on. So then we go to Isildur, which I feel so bad for this actor who plays Isildur. He was completely miscast. He does not look like the epic soldier that Isildur is supposed to be. They, they make him skinny and scrawny and captured by a giant spider. So his father, Elendi, thinks he's dead, and he has gone back to Numenor. So... Uh, Sildor decides he's going to make his way to a port that was once owned by the Numenorians. They used it for trading or whatever. He runs into a homeless person who he saves from some wild men, but they steal his horse. But he's saved by that elf guy with the buzz cut and Theo. And you find out the homeless woman is actually a spy of Adar's. Anyway, you, he goes to the port and it's discovered that the Numenorians have abandoned the port after returning to the island. So the people of the south who escaped Adar, they have taken it over as their new home, basically. So Theo, who is still annoying, by the way, he was the worst character of season one, maybe besides Guy Ladriel. I don't know why he's still around. His mother's dead. He's the one who caused the Southlands to be taken over by the orcs to begin with. He's the one who got the key for Adar's henchmen and set off a geyser that caused a volcano to erupt. I'm not a volcanoologist, but I don't think that's how it works. Anyway, he's still around. He should she, he should have been killed off in season one. He's a terrible character. The Buzzcut Elf, I don't have a problem with per se. It's just he doesn't look like an elf. Elves are supposed to have long hair. It's my, the same criticism I have as Elrond in The High King. Why don't they have the long straight hair? You know, it's, it's so stupid. So Theo and the elf guy... They're kind of in a conflict, which, yeah, duh. The elf guy basically got these people in this position. He convinced them to abandon a fort, a fortified fort, and to take over this little town and let orcs besiege them. It was so stupid. And that's resulted in the death of Theo's mom, which, I, again, Theo should have died. So Theo helps Isildur get his horse back. So what's going on in Numenor? So the queen region is blind now. She got blinded somehow when the volcano exploded. It's never really explained how, why that made her go blind, but she's blind now. She's about to be coronated, and she goes up to her father, who had just passed away, to find her palantir has been stolen. 
turns out that Isildur's sister, who is, by the way, not a character in the Cerulean, they made her up so she can be cooler than her dad, Aunt Elindy, and Isildur, obviously, and she has stolen it. Well, she decides that because the Queen Regent had been using the Palantir, that she shouldn't be queen. So she goes to the cousin, who definitely has designs on the on the throne, and they plan like this little thing where they disrupt the queen's coronation. Uh, Isildur's sister, who I can't even remember her name, that's how unmemorable she was, she throws the Palantir down and says, "This, these are the eyes of your queen regent, you know, insult of her being blind. And the cousin's like, no, our queen would never do that, you know, kind of trying to see like he's standing up to her. But then the queen's like, no, I did use it. <laughs> I should have used it. <laughs> well, so this causes kind of a scuffle. Um, is, uh, Elindy is still loyal to the queen. It's kind of implied that he might have a thing for her, you know, because he's a widower. And then an eagle shows up. And so the cousin walks up to the eagle. And then one of the cousin's henchmen is like, the eagle supports the cousin. And they all cheer. So the final story arc is the stranger who is definitely not Gandalf, right? He's on the run with Poppy, I think her name is, something like that. And, you know, the not hobbit, the harfoot, they're wandering around in the desert. The friend joins them. I think her name's Dory. I don't know why she was re-added. They didn't need her anymore. I guess they wanted to keep that Frodo and Sam dynamic, but Frodo and Sam, they are not. And they find out that this dark wizard is following them. They managed to get out of the desert, but then decide to go back into it because of the dark wizard's forces. And they confuse the dark wizard's fortress forces, so they go a different direction. But then they find this well, and while they're getting water, they cause kind of a ruckus, and so it kind of makes a ringing sound like a bell. Oh, all of a sudden, the Dark Wizard's forces are just there. They're just, hi there. Well, so then, not Gandalf, he starts, um, earlier he had made like this big wine fest about how he wanted a staff. He just finds some random stick and casts a spell that creates a sandstorm and blows the bad guys away, but he loses control over it because he doesn't seem to have control of his powers. By the way, when the wizards came to Middle-earth, they had full control of their powers. So this is completely ridiculous. And that's kind of the gist of it. That's That brings you up to speed. So I know it's not like a full breakdown of what I usually do, but now that they're going to go back to one at a time, I'll resume doing the full episode breakdown. But those are the five, five freaking story arcs that they have created for Rings of Power. I don't like when shows branch off this so much. This was my main complaint about Gotham, was I wanted to see what Bruce Wayne and Gordon were up to, but they kept you know, forcing, especially Enigma and Penguin and sometimes Barbara Keene for some reason. The three of them were always getting their own story arcs, and sometimes you lost track. Neither here nor there. I like it where it's just one or two storylines. That's not what's happening here. There is five main storylines. I left off the subplots. Th those are the big five. Those are the ones you have to keep track of. The subplots, you can ignore them. No one gives a crap. Once again, though, Amazon shows that they know nothing about Lord of the Rings. They don't know anything about the Cimmerillion. And by the way, I'm not going to call the show the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. It will just be Rings of Power. If I do, it's a slip. I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm human. I'm sure I'll slip up. But the show is just Rings of Power. It is nothing like Tolkien or his works. Now, if this had just been a generic fantasy show that Amazon was putting together and they said it's in the vein of Game of Thrones or in the vein of, Ring of Lord of the Rings, I could have maybe seen this as being passable, but that's not what it is. It's an adaption of the Cimmerillion, which takes over a thousand years in the world of Middle Earth, over a thousand. I think it's even over 2000. And they're trying to cram it all together into this abridged version. And certainly for a TV or even a movie adaption, that's not unacceptable. They had to leave some stuff out of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Now, Hobbit, they had to add in more stuff because they wanted it to be a trilogy. So they added some stuff in from the appendices. They didn't need to do that. You could have stretched The Hobbit to two films, but they made it three because Peter Jackson, he likes trilogies. Okay, good for him. Rings of Power makes me want to apologize for my criticism of The Hobbit. That's how bad this show is. No one is like any of the characters. It's what I complain about with Batman, with modern day Star Trek, especially this Kurtzman era with Star Wars. It's like they take something, slap the label on it, but it's 
nothing like the original. There's no sense of true heroism. There's no sense of courage. It's all this vain vapidness, this idea that only anger is the legitimate emotion. The idea that Galadriel, when she was just a wise soothsayer, the person who brought wisdom, who made a golden mist to help the elves and the humans in the War of the North in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. They've turned her into just some sort of machismo elf who wants to emulate her brother who was, who was a warrior. She comes off as extremely selfish, as extremely entitled. Elrond is just her whipping boy. And by the way, Elrond is supposed to be her son-in-law. He is married to her daughter, Liv Tyler, who played Arwen. Arwen is her granddaughter. But here in this show, no, we can't have Gladriel being married. Now, she does allude to being a widow at some point. She mentions it in one episode. I really think that was tacked on. So people are like, oh, she is married. Maybe she does have a daughter out there. I hope they introduce that soon, although maybe not with these writers or these showrunners because she is nothing like how she is in the Cimmerillion. She's wise, she's smart, she's clever, and she's always giving out these wisdoms that she gets from her foresight. But here in this, she's lecturing, she's self-righteous, and like I said, incredibly selfish. El Elrond just exists to be her whipping boy. That's all he is. He is just there to do that. And Numenor, they are so apart. You've got Elindi and Isildur, Yes, and also the king of Numenor was very corrupt, which I think that's what they're setting up the cousin to be, the one who causes the destruction of Numenor. But I'm curious how they're going to do that because they've already brought Hel Halibrand, who was Sauron in human form, to there. Well, that's how Numenor gets destroyed is they have a battle with Mordor. They capture Sauron and he takes on the form of a beautiful man, and he's the one who convinces Numenor, the Numenor and kings, he's like, hey, I'm a king too, trust me, bro, to invade the Undying Lands. And so, as a result, the Valar destroy Numenor, and many of them evacuate, and they go on to establish the kingdoms of Rohan, Gondor, and some of the other human kingdoms around there. But Sauron gets cursed with never being beautiful again, and that's why he wears that armor. And by the way, I might be saying, but Jacob, didn't you say in, in the pilot that he looked very beautiful? No, he looked like a boy band star. He looked like they just plastered on some makeup and put him together. This man, in this form, I mean, as Halibran, he is supposed to still be powerful. He is Sauron. He has the power of Morgoth. But here he's allowed to be beaten by some orcs and a Uruk. And he has to weasel his way back into their good graces. And they're also doing this weird thing with the orcs where they're making them where like they have families. Orcs are literally made from mud. The earliest orcs were elves who had turned against the Valar and had sided with Morgoth. That's how the orcs were created. And then later, of course, Dark Wizards created the way of making them through mud and then advanced them when they combined them with human blood and turned them into the Uruks. That's how they come about. They are engineered for evil, for violence. They have no sense of care. They have no sense of peace. They want to go to war. And this idea that because the orcs are less powerful than, say, the kingdoms of man or the kingdoms of elf, that that makes them a victim is preposterous. They are evil incarnate. They are your greatest fears incarnate. And to downgrade them to just these people who just want to live in peace and be in harmony and wrestle with wargs, it's absolutely disgusting and an affront to the legacy of heroism that Tolkien created in his masterpiece, The Lord of the Rings, and its prequel, The Cimmerillion. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked that video, be sure to give it a like, tell all your friends about it, leave me a comment, tell me what you think, and subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, ring that little bell so you get notifications whenever I post a new vidcast, and consider becoming a channel member where you get all kinds of perks. If you don't want to support me on Big Tech, Click on the link to my locals community. It's kind of like a Patreon or subscribe star. You can give me tips for my articles that I post there or become a monthly subscriber. It really helps out small indie creators like myself. You can also pick up one of my novels. You can find them all on Amazon. Just search their titles, Cacophony, The Seven Royals, or Blessed Child, and my name, and they should come up right away. I really appreciate it. Leave me a five-star review. Once again, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time right here on Studio Jake.